KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227, or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you. And welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet. I'm here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. Uh, Laurent Landis took today off so he could be with Gabrielle to do an Easter egg hunt. Uh, Patty and I decided since it's Easter and Passover, we'd both have our pastors on. Um, she was going to bring her pastor, Robert Jeffress, and uh, I brought mine, <laughs> Rabbi Steve Fish. What? Oh, well, he couldn't make it. He's, he's, he's probably, busy. He's fellowshipping, I'm sure. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I know you tried. <laughs> I know, and, and I tried. And I tried to, uh, you know, go get the people from what? What is it? Westbrook? Westboro? 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 Right. Westboro, right. I tried to get them from Westboro, but they uh, just wouldn't they, come they, with me. I, I even offered to go up and pick them up. Uh, um, well, so I guess we're just, you know, you couldn't get your pastor, so we're just not yeah. going to be able to do the Easter part of it because she can speak of, uh, as a pastor. Uh, have you ever heard her talk about religion? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, her. You know how my questions sometimes are off the wall. Expect Patty's to be today to be genuinely dumb. <laughs> David, with his usually benevolent spirit. <laughs> Thank you. We yes. have we have a Jewish holiday known as Yom Kippur, where we atone for our sins. And yeah. David, it's a one-day uh, holiday, I take a week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you need a week. That's right. But David starts the minute after Yom Kippur is over to be sure that he has something for next year. Yeah. <laughs> and I usually and every do. Every day thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Rabbi Fish, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming back uh, <laughs> after the last time. <laughs> God knows what we did to him that time. But <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about Passover and what it is, and, and a little bit even its relation to uh, to Easter uh, and, and w what it means. So first of all, what is Passover? Okay. Passover, let's go back to the biblical origin of Passover. Biblical origin of Passover is that really reading the whole book of Exodus, you know the story of Passover. And I'm sure everyone here has, everyone who who is here and uh, who is listening to us at this hour has read the entire book of Exodus. But it's basically let my people go. Mm -hmm. um, the Hebrew people were slaves in the land of Egypt. They originally were invited in. Uh, Joseph, in fact, was uh, Pharaoh's right-hand man. But then the book of Exodus begins as then there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And the Hebrews were in, to make a long story short, because I could take the whole hour just reading the book of Exodus. In fact, I have it here on my computer. And, <laughs> but, uh, in, but in essence, uh, Pharaoh enslaved the Jews. The Jews desire freedom after a series of plagues. Uh, Pharaoh lets the Jewish people go. The Jewish people leave via the parting of the Re of the Sea of Reeds. You've seen Charlton Heston do that, and uh, <laughs> fabulous technicolor. That's right, and they go into the desert. I've got to tell you a story. You know, I've got to digress. I'm a rabbi. Mm -hmm. uh, I happened to be one uh, Easter weekend. It didn't happen to correspond with Passover that year. I don't remember why. But anyway, I was on one of the little trains going, or the trams going around uh, DFW, and Charlton Heston was on there. <laughs> and Charlton Heston was heading for a tennis tournament. I, I was the rabbi at that point in Corpus Christi, and I knew Charlton Heston was heading for Corpus Christi. And I said, well, there are going to be two miracles this weekend. First of all, you're, you're parting the Red Sea. And secondly, you're going for a tennis tournament in Corpus Christi. And he says, of course, in his deep, deep bass voice, I know how one of them is going to turn out. <laughs> <laughs> 
but you have to peel the the tennis racket from his cold dead mm -hmm. hands. I had to no, I had to get his uh, rifle. He was still he was carrying it at that time. You know his NRA membership uh, sticker across his front, and anyway, he almost shot me. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so the Jews shot their way across the Red Sea. <laughs> the Jews shot their way across the Red Sea. It was with rocket boosters. Ah, is that how they made it? Yeah, that's okay. how they that's how they made it. Okay. And the Sea of Reeds, by the way, is now the way it's translated, not the Red Sea. So we don't really know that it was actually the Red Sea, but the Red Sea is that sea that's in between Egypt and uh, the Sinai. Sinai, right. But there is also a thin sea that is the Sea of Reeds between those, those places. Mm. And the translation is inexact. We're not sure exactly where it is. In fact, we were talking beforehand. Uh, there is no archaeological evidence uh, from Egyptian sources that the Exodus ever happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they kept pretty uh, immaculate records, of, right? Pretty um, accurate, of, accurate records of, of, of what actually who who they had enslaved, who was working, who built things. That's right. They they had time cards created by IBM, mm -hmm. and <laughs> each and each slave had to clock in. And unfortunately, you know, we've never been able to find those time cards. We we did find a computer tape, but unfortunately, it was written in hieroglyphics, and we couldn't understand it. Uh, but uh, the reality is that there's no historical proof or archaeological proof that the uh, that the Jews were enslaved, or that the that they actually left. Uh, Egypt and uh, you know and trekked back and trekked back and forth for 40 years to the promised land but uh, the point is that whether this is a metaphor whether this is an allegory or as we suspect these were folk myths that were passed down from generation to generation of people sitting around the campfire telling stories of their heroes of the past or even whether, and this is a liberal interpretation, at some later time the Jews wrote this story to create this great hero Moses who was responsible for all the laws of Judaism and all the stories of Judaism. We don't know, and for me as a liberal Jew it doesn't matter. Uh, Orthodox Jews would take the story literally, and, or do take the story literally, and uh, but but for me it doesn't matter if uh, Moses was a historical figure, if Moses would have met, was an allegorical figure, if these things actually happen. What's cool is the fact that as we go farther in the Book of Exodus, and in the entire Torah for that matter, principles of morality and ethics are presented that were far before any other people, mm -hmm. and have influenced mankind, humankind ever since. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't really matter in Judaism if certain events happened or if these are stories. What's important is the lesson from it. Correct. And how that's you in, live your life. Yeah, that's in liberal Judaism, David. And uh, it's all about don't be E.G. Marshall. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> now, if you had an Orthodox rabbi sitting here, which he wouldn't be unless he walked here on Passover, mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to get into that today. <laughs> but uh, if you had an Orthodox rabbi sitting here, and in fact, you know, I might hear from one, one of my Orthodox colleagues later, uh, Orthodox Judaism, which is the most uh, fundamentalist of the Jewish uh, religious groups, would say, yes, everything happened. Moses wrote all this down, and this is exactly as it happened. And, and that's fine that that's the belief, but my point is that it doesn't change the faith at all? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It doesn't change any of the beliefs at all? No, yeah. change none of the beliefs. And uh, as a liberal Jew, I'm, I'm very comfortable regardless of what happened. Uh, as a liberal Jew, I'm very comfortable if all these events did occur exactly as they're recorded in the Torah or in the later books of the Bible, the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the prophets and the writings known as the Tanakh. I'm very comfortable if they did occur. But if they didn't occur, I'm, I'm okay with yeah, that also. All, all you're really saying is, if it occurred, didn't occur, my religion's the same, my faith's the same, my beliefs are the same. It's, uh, that would be different for uh, what you grew up with, if it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, if it's not in there. I mean, and in, in, in the King James English, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's, that's the way it occurred. You mean yeah. if God said you rather than thou? Yeah. Yeah, it would make it would change the whole religion. <laughs> yeah, it's a um, it's an amazing thing, you know. And if, for our listeners who don't or maybe new, um, I remember covering Southern Baptist. 
<laughs> but I don't attend First Baptist Dallas, which is where our beloved Reverend Jeff Jeffress is. You don't. I, um, I who thought that's why you were always late. Books sometimes the service <laughs> runs a little bit late. No, Patty, I know I saw you in that commercial with all those smiling people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what happened? Down in front, down in front of the fountains, and that six thousand seat. Uh, oh no, I've got that confused. I'm sorry. That's American Airlines Center. Yeah. <laughs> pretty darn close <laughs> um okay so uh passover is was is this weekend and this this week the first two nights are the seder what does that mean what does that have to do with passover how is passover celebrated okay i'm kind of the main that's a backwards question but <laughs> well that's okay david i'm used to you asking back <laughs> Backwards questions, and I'll give backwards answer. Thank you. <laughs> no, the reality is, the Seder is a retelling of the story of the Exodus from Egypt. The main purpose, the word Seder means telling, okay? Or actually, it doesn't mean telling. I'm sorry. They can, they're going to revoke my rabbinical ordination. Seder, mean, Seder means order. There is an order of a service which includes symbols from the time of going forth from Egypt and from later times. For example, we have a shank bone on the uh, Seder plate, which is one of the, on which we have all the symbols of Passover. And that shank bone is symbolic not of the time of going forth from Egypt, but of the Passover sacrifice that later came into Judaism, the actual physical sacrifices. We, at Passover, we would sacrifice a lamb. So that's, um, you know, th those are all the symbols. So Seder means order. And the reason for the Seder is educational. It's a retelling every year of the going forth from Egypt. Now, what we've added to it and what we have included in it as years have passed are everything that is related of going forth from slavery to freedom. And slavery does not mean just a physical slavery, but it can be any type of allegorical or metaphorical slavery. Uh, so, you know, we include readings for that also. Okay, so what is the main lesson of Passover? Freedom, period. Uh, if you ask me to describe the main lesson of Passover in one, one word, it's freedom, freedom from persecution, freedom from our own ideas which inhibit us, mm -hmm. uh, freedom in the broadest sense of the word. Um, and um, I want to get back to that in a second. What are, there's are some very strict traditions of what you eat, like the matzah? Right. Um, Yum. Yum. Oh, yeah. I should have brought I should have brought some today, but the problem is if I'd eat some, then I wouldn't be able to talk any because it's so dry. Uh, uh, in Exodus, there is a passage that as the people were leaving Egypt, they didn't have time to actually bake bread. So they poured some flour and water on rocks, and it created this substance called matzah. Um, and we are commanded to eat it during the entire Passover holiday. We are also uh, told that we should not eat, eat anything, that, that uh, mitzvah, that commandment extends to eating anything that is leavened. So, so no donuts. No, no, no oh, donuts, don't even no. mention it, Patty, please. <laughs> no <laughs> cake, oh, sorry, no nothing. sorry. No sorry. cake, no nothing, no donuts. So um, as the Jews were leaving, they um, cut these uh, matzahs into squares, uh, into matzah squares, put them into Manischewitz boxes, carried them on their head, and on top of that, square bottles of wine. Right, exactly. <laughs> they had, uh, well, they had, they cut, <laughs> they cut the matzah into precise squares. Mm -hmm. They had to be exactly eight inches by eight inches, mm -hmm. or whatever the dimension was at that, at time. that time. They, did, they, they didn't, they didn't, have, they didn't have inches yet. They had what, David? Dunams. Dunams, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, I don't know dunam. Anyway. Uh, uh, so because of that, we then took the matzah and crumpled it up, and even though we didn't have time to let the bread rise, we had plenty of time to make the matzah balls, uh, mix it with a little bit of eggs, refrigerate it for 15 minutes, and dump it into a pot of boiling broth. Right, and then make, it, make, this, <laughs> make this delicacy. Uh, now, the, the problem with matzah balls... Uh, is that it, matzo balls require a very exact time mm -hmm. in the refrigerator, in the boiling water, with the amount of eggs, with the amount of oil, and all that. 
If you don't, they become violent projectiles, <laughs> which can be very hard. One is judged in their Jewish culinary skills by how soft we can make the matzo balls. I, I thought it's one of the greatest sins in Judaism to make a hard matzo ball and serve it. Oh, well, to well, serve to, it. to serve it. That would be, yeah. I'm sure many people may have, have made the bad matzo balls. To, to serve it right. If, if it's too hard, we simply ship them to Israel and they use them as rockets. Ah, I see. <laughs> Um, so uh, then, um, where did the tradition of the gefilte fish come from? Minnesota. Yeah, <laughs> it did. No. Gefilte fish is purely an Eastern European um, creation. And, and, and then uh, the, the other uh, traditional Jewish food is Kung Pao chicken. <laughs> no, 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 David, that's on Yom Kippur when people don't eat in their homes or synagogue. Oh, okay. And, and you go out to the Chinese restaurant. And you go out to the Chinese. No, that's on, uh, I'm uh, sorry. On I'm, I'm really getting everything mixed up. That's on Christmas, on Christmas Eve, Eve that we eat, yeah, Jews eat Chinese food on, on Christmas so Eve. So is, is it okay to eat pork during Passover as long as it's wrapped in matzah? Absolutely. You can have pork. By, I, I had an aunt who really did not understand Judaism that well at all. And my parents were visiting her. This is a true story, so help me. The lightning may strike me if, I, if it's not true. Better watch out for the studio and be ready to get out. <laughs> but no, it really is a true story that uh, they came to visit her and she said, well, I've got some of the best pork chops ready for y'all. And my parents looked at her kind of askance because pork is not tradi a traditional Jewish meal. No. And, <laughs> no, it isn't. And she said, but they're done with matzo meal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that must make it okay. That, that, that made it perfectly okay. And uh, my parents scraped the matzo meal off the top, and that's all they ate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't we take our break? Uh, we're talking to Rabbi Steve Fish from Congregation Beth El Bana. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. We're talking Passover. We're going to get to the theme of Passover, which is freedom, and how that relates to these religious freedom laws that are going around the country right now. We'll be back with more right after this. I'm Christina from the Orange, and I listen to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. <laughs> See you there. Yeah. Yeah. And we're back uh, with Done. Lambda Weekly. Um, oh, I already did. I, I, think, I think you kind of did already. Uh, I think that went out over there. Uh, it did not go out over there. Okay. Okay, um, well, uh, since we're discussing Passover, I wanted to discuss uh, traditionally Passover seders, the seder meal, is ha are held at homes. But in case of our congregation, Bethel Binah, the second night we have a community seder, that is for all members of our congregation who... And friends who who want to come observe the Passover together with their friends and with their congregational members, and this year we just had an exceptional seder. First of all, because it was led by me, <laughs> and and secondly, I'm not throwing in a plug because I'm not mentioning anything. But if you go to the corner of Campbell and Preston, it's really really they, great they, food. They really did a great job of catering the the seder. They really and, did. And you know what was fun about it? Also, since they're Jewish, mm -hmm. they enjoyed participating in the Seder while they were serving too. So, that's, you know, that's, it exact, those, that's exactly yeah. it. So thanks, no plug to Zorik. But, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, the, the theme you said of the Seder is freedom. Theme of the Seder absolutely is freedom. And over the last few weeks, uh, these religious freedom laws have been popping up in state legislatures. Uh, what happened in Indiana this week? Um, Indiana's been very interesting, mm -hmm. to say the least. Yeah, Indiana imploded this week. Indiana did. Um, and for many in the um, Final Four um, scramble, they're, they're imploding, too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if you're we, we we are sorry if you're a Kentucky fan. Mm -hmm. We really yeah. are. Yeah, that was that was a sad thing. But in the state of Indiana, they um, the legislature passed a bill um, that um, they say very erroneously was modeled exactly after the federal law um, of the same title, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. Uh, with what, what does the federal law do? What's the the federal law yeah. it only applies because of a Supreme Court case. It only applies to the federal um, government. It can't apply to states. Um, but in it, it says that the government 
um, cannot um, restrict anyone's um, religious beliefs. What they've done in Indiana is to say not only government, but they've defined person to include, as we know, corporations. Mm -hmm. So for-profit businesses and individuals can um, can go to court and say that they've been their religious beliefs have been substantially burdened um, by, for example, serving gay people in mm -hmm. their store. Um, and so, or their restaurant or whatever it might be. And that, so it's far beyond what just anything from government. It's to, it would allow parties to be individuals, corporations against individuals, you know, um, shopping. So that's, that's a vast difference, huge difference in scope. And people, I think, um, were lying on the other side when they said it was basically like the federal one. Now, the way they got rid of the Oklahoma law two weeks ago was, um, Emily Virgin, who is a an Oklahoma City straight uh, representative, she uh, submitted a an amendment to their religious freedom restoration bill Act, yeah. that said anybody can discriminate. You just have to post it. Who uh, it is? Who's, who's who it is? Who, who, you know, I, I won't serve black people. I won't serve. Uh, gay people, whoever you won't serve, needs to be in your business, needs to be on your website, in your advertising, and that way nobody walks in by mistake and there's no, you know, there's no um, uh, embarrassment there. A and also, if my friends and relatives who wouldn't have been discriminated against didn't care to do business with them, well, they'd know too. Yeah. That bill got pulled that night. Yes. She was brilliant. That's it the was. way you kill one of these bills. Now, you um, have to post it. I think you should be able to post it up. And that's why they don't, can't, you know, straggle in other things. Right. It's like these are my beliefs. Let's and write it down today. And then, you and know, this is who I who I will not serve. Now, um Kind of, kind of, kind of reminiscent of the '60s and who would not be served, right? Uh -huh. Or exactly. uh, and earlier than that in the '50s, uh, neighborhoods that says you know no you no blacks or Jews thing. allowed. Okay, right? so so you've been oppressed. <laughs> oh, I am very oppressed. I'm eating matzah for eight days. Um, <laughs> where does and this this is the the question that I think some right wing Christians don't understand. What's the difference between oppression? And, and just minding your own business, where's the difference? Where is the line between your freedom of religion and my freedom of religion? Where, where does, how do we balance those things? Well, first of all, government has no business being at all involved in religion. If we have a strict separation of church and state, which we've never had, I mean, Thomas Jefferson wrote extensively on where religion and state should interact and mm -hmm. intersect and should not intersect. But if we have a strict separation of church and state, then the state has no business of interfering in any religious uh, activities whatsoever. And these law, this law which was passed in Indiana, the laws that are proposed in several other states, uh, really want to get politics in the middle of religion because they want to f they want to pass laws that are although they call them religious freedom laws that's like calling the Nuremberg laws Jewish freedom laws I mean that's as uh, oppressive as they are uh, perhaps I'm being a little bit exaggerating there but at the same time what they're doing is deliberately passing these laws so that they can further their own prejudices mm -hmm. and further their own uh, desires to not serve certain people. Now we have a bill going through the legislature right now it's uh, House Bill 50, uh, 2553 by Representative Molly White if you don't know the name now you will over the next uh, few terms of hers because God is she a wacko. Uh, <laughs> What? We have so many, though. No, you know, we do. I think she's going for the prize. Okay. I, I walked well, into her office with some people who uh, were constituents of hers, and they were told, don't waste our time, and, or I don't want to waste your time, and better yet, you're not going to waste mine. Now get out of here. <gasps> that, that's a quote. Uh, yeah, she's, she's delightful. Anyway, uh, her bill would allow business owners to decide whom they serve or conduct business with based on religious convictions. Okay, <laughs> Steve, tell us, what's wrong with that? Where do you start? Yeah, where do, where you, do start? you start? I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I turn the question around. What's right with that? I mean, it is, it goes 
blatantly against the U.S. Constitution. It goes blatantly against the Civil Rights Act. So are you saying if you're a business owner Mm -hmm. and somebody walks into your business, you should do business with them? Absolutely. If you hang your shingle out in the public marketplace, it's it's open to everybody. Wow. I I never thought of it that. So you're saying if you charge one person $10 for something, you should charge somebody else. But if you have more people coming in, you might make more money? Oh, (laughs) gee, what a a novel principle. And and what really chaps me about Uh all of this is like with the the pizzeria that that the... Oh, that was a fake. That was so phony. Well, but the, the, the idea of it, though, um, that we would not serve um, a gay wedding, mm-hmm. for example, um, or the other, the other establishments that said that they would not serve gay Okay, people. everybody doesn't know what you're talking about. What, what is this pizzeria? It was That's, in Indiana. Um, it was Memories Pizza, and I guess it is Memories because it's, you They know, closed. They closed. <laughs> uh, they saved due to threats and such, but... Um, the right wing's raising them money, so I guess they retired. They, they raised um, a half a million dollars for these people in one day. Yep. I'm in the but wrong business. A, apparently. A TV station in, um, in Indiana in went, South Bend. Uh, went um, you know, basically soliciting, how do you feel about this law? Do you think you're going to run your business under it? Blah, blah, blah. And they, found, they finally found somebody that would say, well, we're not going to do a gay wedding. Well, they don't do any catering at all. Mm-hmm. They, you know, it's like... You know, it just reminds me of the, of, what's your name, Governor of Jam, Jam Brewer saying, well, I'm not going to run for another term. Well, now you're prohibited by the state constitution of Arizona. You can't run for a third term. But, you but know, that, so it's, they pizza, don't ever did, they never did it. But they that never, pizza place, um, I, all she was doing was just spouting what she'd heard. Mm-hmm. You know, she heard, oh, uh, we're all going to be forced to serve gay weddings. Well, you know something? And if I saw it once, I saw it 10,000 times. What self-respecting gay person has pizza at their wedding? <laughs> well, I guess there's some gay rednecks from, from Italy who serve pizza at their wedding. Well, you Instead know, of having big case, tradition. That's right. It's a big tradition. You know, <laughs> Brian and I were planning on pizza, but we've switched to McDonald's now. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, Aaron and I were saying, well, it would be very hoity-toity stuff and a la minute. I mm-hmm. mean, like you would be make your little pizza they would make it for you on to order you know right there at the wedding reception maybe that but what she was really doing she was just spouting that garbage that she heard in in the media for especially from right wing fox and you know and that kind of garbage that fox is right wing no they're right wing garbage oh okay there's a difference okay um and you you can be conservative i i you know there are there are two sides to every story at least but okay. there's a difference between conservative and right-wing garbage that's just spouting lies for the purpose of uh, inciting bigotry. And that's what this has done. Oh, they're going to force me to cater gay weddings. You know what? In your little town of 1,500 people, if, if a gay couple came in, you probably know them already. Right. Well, and what's crazy is they asked one business who said that they wouldn't cater a wedding and um, if you would then deny service to people who are adulterers, people who divorce, mm-hmm. people who all these other things. She says, no, we would serve them. And they said, well, do you, you know, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. And she said, well, there's a big difference in sins, those sins. There is. Adultery is one of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Being gay is not. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what number so is? So that's the difference. Must be. That's but for, for our listeners who haven't been paying attention to the news, um, Indiana fixed their bill. Did and we, they really fix it? I didn't read what it was that the fix was. This is the fix that went into the bill, to the um, amended bill. It, say, it states, um, so the changes prohibit businesses from using the law as a defense in court for refusing, quote, to offer or provide services, facilities, use of public accommodations, goods, employment, or housing to any customers based on, quote, race, color, religion, ancestry, age, national origin, disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or United States military service. Hmm. You know, so, they didn't include the length of one's forefinger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but other, other than that, that sounds pretty inclusive. Or the length yeah. of somebody's middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> right. You were thinking that. I, I was thinking it too, David, but I'm a rabbi. I don't uh, you can't say that. See? 
happy to be there for you. Okay, so. So they, we actually got more protections into th- the bill. Than we had before. Than we had before, yes. Right. It's and the first pl- time they've ever, sexual orientation, gender identity have ever been mentioned in Indiana mm-hmm. law. Mm-hmm. Right. And we applaud the governor of Arkansas who refused to sign their uh, religious freedom law. Under pressure. Right. Uh, right. uh, under pressure, he, he had announced a couple of days before he was going to sign it. but And here's the big deal in Arkansas, is that, you know, they've been touting that the Indiana law and the Arkansas law were so basically the federal law, mm-hmm. you know, exactly like the federal law. Well, with the revamp that came in, in, in Arkansas was to bring it to be exactly like mm-hmm. the federal law. So it couldn't have been be- the same before. Mm-hmm. And then If you're the, changing it. Yeah. So. Okay. So. But we do believe in religious freedom, and we don't believe in infringing on somebody's religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. So where does my religious belief end and yours begin? Because obviously to some people, discriminating against gay people they think is part of their religious belief, Mm -hmm. and other people are gay. (laughs) So where does that end? Oh, and don't mention that, you know, people who divorce or who are adulterers or whatever, they're off the hook. They're really not part of their religion. Do I belief. have a right to discriminate against somebody who's divorced because I don't believe in divorce? Do I? No. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, but but this then, is this is not a uh-huh. laws of the country of our country have always been reflective of societal attitudes. If if you go back to before 1865, the law of the land was slavery was allowed. If you go back before 19, when was Brown versus Board of Education? 53. 53, 53, yeah. Uh, Anyway, if you go back before Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, it was okay to have inferior schools that were labeled separate but equal, and we know they weren't equal. So truly, the laws of the land, they are always of our land. Uh, we've built in safeguards so that laws can be changing, indicative of the times. And, you know, thank God, if this law were passed, this Indiana law, if anybody had thought to pass it in 1960, uh, there probably wouldn't have been any uproar Mm -hmm. because gay rights, uh, I mean, we were just entering into the period of civil rights for African Americans. Um, But now at this time, when the rights of every person, whether gay, whether straight, uh, no matter what, are assumed to be equal to every other, that all rights are equal, finally, um, that all men and women are created equal, that finally the laws are indicative of that and the laws are being written and so, rejected based on that criteria, so I those guess criteria. I, I'm looking for what is the answer to somebody who says, well, now I have to serve gay people, and that goes against my religion. Suck it up. <laughs> you know, put yeah. you up. It, it, yeah, is the answer your religious rights and where my r- religious rights begin? begin? Right. And if, again, if you're a business and you're holding out your shingle to the general public, you cannot turn people away based upon... You know, your decision of who you don't accept. You know, and, and I'm being a devil's advocate when I'm asking this question. I did a story, oh, about two, three months ago about somebody who um, grew up in a small town in Arkansas. Uh, he passed away, and his partner called the church that he grew up in in Arkansas. Would he do the funeral? And uh, th- the pastor just told him, absolutely not. Now, he had a, any pastor has a right not to do any religious service he doesn't want to do, and I'm not sure. saying he should have. If somebody called you, and it was not a service you felt comfortable doing, mm-hmm. would you take two minutes to refer him to somebody else? Yeah, I'm sure I would. Uh, well, first of all, you know, I mean, a service that I would not feel com- the only service with which uh, the only, you, you've got me thinking, so I'm I'm stuttering here a little bit. The only service which I would refuse to conduct would be one of a person who says, I don't like people. Now, people can be Jews, they can be gays, they can be um, African American. Uh, If someone came to me and, and said, would you do a service in which you espouse these beliefs, which are alien to my religion, I, I would uh, not do it. So I suppose that if, you know, if Fred Phelps Jr. 
was asked to do a service and he didn't feel comfortable with doing that, he has the right not to do it. But again, it's not because of political reasons, it's because of religious reasons. It, you know, and, but here is my point with that. Somebody's calling you, their partner just died. Instead of just refusing, wouldn't you help them find somebody who can help them? Oh, absolutely. And, and this does occur with me sometimes because I have certain conditions. I do intermarriages mm -hmm. of uh, Jews and non-Jews. But, but there some are, rabbis don't. Yeah, and some rabbis don't, and that's fine, and they call me sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain Jewish funeral traditions which Orthodox rabbis insist upon which I, as a Reform rabbi, do not insist upon. And the Orthodox rabbi, uh, Orthodox rabbi, call one of the Orthodox rabbis in town, who is a community, a chaplain to the whole Jewish community, will regularly call me and say, would you be willing, not would you be willing, or are you available, because he already knows that I'm willing, to do this funeral in which Orthodox customs are not followed. And I say, sure, because it's a mitzvah. It's a commandment, a commandment and a good deed. That's the definition of mitzvah, those two put together, uh, to uh, help those who are grieving. You know, my point with this case was, why are you a pastor if you couldn't take two minutes? There are five churches in this town, and you couldn't give this guy who's grieving, obviously. Uh, and it, it's somebody that you baptized as a child. You couldn't give him the name of a, a number of another pastor. I, I thought that was Well, and, and wow. what's really, I think, really... I think it's bigoted. It's hugely bigoted. Uh, and of course it is. But if that's his calling for being as, as a pastor, wow. And what, what really irritates me um, from an LGBT perspective is when um, people in the fright wing, I call them, uh, those fright wing extremists, um, you know, talk about, well, you know, with, with um, allowing gay couples to get married, it's going to cause, you know, they, they're going to be forced, we're going to be forced to do things in our religion that we're not, or they'll sue us or whatever. And, and I just think that's so stupid. It's not going to happen. It's not, it's not happened. You know, I mean, like, Catholic priests don't always marry, uh, conduct a marriage a wedding service for um, two people who are not both Catholic um, or someone, for someone who's been divorced. Um, you know, and, and it goes on and on from, from religion to religion, and nobody's been forced by the government to conduct any a, sort any of marriage. Uh, yeah, exactly. You've turned down marriage. And that's not going to change because gay people get married. Right. Absolutely. And what I've said is that nobody has the right to come into my synagogue and to tell me, based on a government law, based on government, that I should or should not marry anyone, any more that I should go into a Catholic church and uh, say, Father, this is not the way you should c conduct communion. Uh, that is a religious right. Mm -hmm. And it's a per, you know, where I think we get confused in the United States is when we get to politics confused with religion. And I think that what has happened over the last few years that I have seen are the right-wing evangelicals have used religion to promulgate their viewpoint while trying to deny those of other religions using their religious viewpoint to, to uh, state what they feel is right. And I have always said, and I, I said this in my first ever uh, sermon at Beth El Bina, is that I have my own beliefs. I will definitely have my own beliefs. And what I will say is, yes, what I'm doing is right. But then I add two words, for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as long as anyone, any religion, does that, says what I'm doing is right for me, and, of course, what they do is ethically and morally responsible, not only responsible, but correct, and I think we can agree on that, uh, then I have every bit of respect for their religion. I mean, I'm not going to take communion, but, you know, for me to ask a Catholic not to take communion? Yeah, it's their truth. <laughs> exactly. And let's take what, a break. And that's really crazy, too, about we should start it with, I believe, mm -hmm. instead of declaring them these things as facts and truth. We right. need to take a break. Uh, I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late heathen Patty Fink, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Rabbi Steve Fish is our guest today. We'll be back with more right after this. This is William. I download Lambda Weekly Podcast from LambdaWeekly.com. 
And welcome back to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink uh, operating the board. As always, is our Chris and Josh Manus. Uh, Doc is here doing our video podcast. Those are usually up online for you to watch, oh, two or three days after the show. And our guest today. <laughs> David's choking up. Yeah, yeah. he's all choked up. Our guest David, I'm, I, I'm so honored that you get choked up at even thinking about or mentioning my name. <laughs> I, I am so honored. Our guest today is Rabbi <laughs> Steve Fish from Congregation <laughs> Beth Elbina. Um, we were talking a little bit about the religious freedom laws, and those have everything to do with the fear that same-sex marriage is approaching. It's going to happen uh, when the Supreme Court first hears the case the end of April and then rules on it the end of June. Um, and, and some things could happen that that doesn't happen, but that's what we're expecting. Um, the, the argument by a lot of religious people, especially the ones that get on most talk shows that you hear, is same-sex marriage is against everybody's religion, and you would think it would be. What's the Jewish belief on same-sex marriage? Okay. The Jewish belief on same-sex mar marriage, I think, has been stated most eloquently not by a reform rabbi, not by a conservative rabbi. But, and not even by an Orthodox rabbi, but by a Hasidic rabbi. His name is Shmuley Boteach, and he has been roundly criticized by members of the Orthodox community. He says, yes, in, in Leviticus there is one sentence that goes against homosexuality. And it's pretty clear, although you can look at it and say, well, it couldn't be clear because the law states you can't have sex with a man in the same way that you can have sex with a woman. Obviously, men don't have the vaginal opening, so there's no way possible. But what they're referring is to, of course, intercourse in, in a different manner. But what Rabbi Boteach says so eloquently is in the Jewish tradition there are 613 commandments that are stated in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. That's one of them. When you have observed completely the other 612, then come to me and say, okay, I don't want anyone not observing that one law. And to me, that is, it's ironic because the rabbinical body of Hasidic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism, none of these have come forward in favor of uh, same-sex marriage. The rabbinical bodies of Reform and Conservative Judaism have. Have come in, in favor of and reconstruction. And, and reconstructionist, right. The more liberal Jewish bodies have come forward in favor of same-sex marriage. Uh, but the most eloquent message is from an Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. And the same, in, I think, in the, in the Christian faith, um, in, the, in the, the Protestant faith, and even in many, many Roman Catholics, uh, tens of millions of Americans who self-identify as Christian support marriage equality mm -hmm. and equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in this country. Mm -hmm. And so with the, when the fright-wingers say, um, you know, how can you be Christian and, and support gay people? Well, it's a very natural thing for many, many denominations of Protestantism and millions of Roman Catholics in this country. So they don't have a lock on the word Christian. They just don't. They want to, but they don't. Um, so um, it, Orthodox doesn't have a position really on it. They haven't voted against it. They won't do it, mostly. Well, for the most part, the, I mean, an Orthodox rabbi won't do it. And secondly, um, the Orthodox Judaism states that you should observe all 613 of those commandments plus thousands of others that are stated in the Talmud, a later uh, book of law of Judaism. And so, yes, they would say most, and I, I can't speak for all of my Orthodox colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, and each Jew has their own opinion and each rabbi, but in Orthodox Judaism, the rabbis are constrained by the laws of the Torah, so I would doubt very seriously that any of my Orthodox colleagues would conduct a same-sex uh, wedding. Okay, so um, what if you're a Reform rabbi and just don't happen to believe in same-sex marriage? If you're a Reform rabbi, uh, you are free to do what your conscience says. Reform stresses autonomy mm -hmm. uh, among every rabbi. 
And although all of the major institutions of Reform Judaism, or I should say both of them, the Central Conference of American Rabbis and the Union for Reform Judaism, have made strong statements in favor of complete equality mm -hmm. for the LGBT population, including marriage and including rabbinic ordination in the Reform and Conservative and Reconstructionist movement for the LGBT population. The new head of the um, Central Conference of American right, Rabbis. Right, and the new head head of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, Rabbi Denise Egger, is a lesbian and uh, was denied the right to come out of the closet for many years mm -hmm. and suffered discrimination in her job placement for many years, but she's now president of the rabbinical body of Reformed Judaism. That's quite a statement it, in yeah. itself. Okay. Same thing going on in the Baptist Church, uh, Patty? No, in fact, um, I would be, you know, if far be it for a not only a lesbian, but just a mere woman to be <laughs> To mm. be leading the Southern Baptist Convention in right. any way, shape, or form. I, I, I thought uh, there was a lesbian the head of Southern Baptist Convention. No. No, not no. so you noticed. Oh, no. okay. I, I just no. wondering. Okay, she's still in the closet, but she thinks she's head of the Southern Baptist. I, I shouldn't say that. As a Jew, I'm not allowed to say that. But, but in reality, you know, you ask the question: Would a Reform Rabbi be free to uh, perform that wedding or not perform that wedding? Absolutely. Okay, so here's one of my questions with these religious freedom laws, and actually there was a lawsuit filed in North Carolina that has gotten nowhere, that has not gotten a hearing, uh, by Reform Judaism, by um, United Church of Christ, and several, I think Unitarians joined the uh, suit, and that suit is saying, uh, you are infringing on my religious right as a rabbi to not let me perform a legal wedding, whereas all of these other religions are saying it's infringing for you to do that wedding. Right. How do you feel about that? Well, I come forward with the same statement I just made a few minutes ago, and I'll make it until I'm six feet under. And uh, if I'm talking when I'm six feet under, which some rabbis do, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, until, until my dying day, I will say that marriage is a religious proposition, period. Now, Unfortunately, or, or fortunately, because of the civil nature of property rights, it has to be, there has to be a political, not a political, but a legal uh, aspect to it. But that legal aspect doesn't have to infringe on anybody's religious rights. Um, so I, I really think, I think very strongly that the freedom of who we should marry, when we should marry, where we should marry, would be an individual and a religious decision to be decided within that religious body. So it is something that should be decided within your own religion. But again, here's where I'm, uh, where I'm asking, where does your religious discrimination or your religious beliefs start infringing on mine? Where do mine infringe on yours? Uh, if you don't believe in same-sex marriage, and I do, aren't you infringing by stopping me in my synagogue? Well, and, and why wouldn't I also stop people who can't procreate, since apparently, and according to them, you know, procreation is the sole purpose of marriage. Um, you know, so older people and people who choose not to have children or who can't. Um, you know, should not be married either. Okay, well, let's go to that definition because the state, state of Texas, argued in the uh, Fifth Circuit. Uh, Louisiana made absolutely moronic arguments in the Fifth Circuit. As did Texas, by the way. Well, Texas was, yes. Uh, by, Tex by the time it got to Texas, I think the judges were so frustrated that... The absurdity of, upon absurdity was so, crazy. Right. So what is the definition of marriage, then? It, it's not solely for procreation. No, marriage is not solely for procreation. Marriage is a union between two people who love, respect, care for each other, and want to spend their time in this sacred relationship. The term for marriage in Judaism is kiddushin. And for those listeners who are Jewish, you know of the word, the root word kiddush, which means holiness, but it means more than that. It means set apart. It means that this is a relationship that is like, that is set apart from any other relationship. And it's set apart by the definition of marital fidelity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in Judaism, uh, Kiddushin may be any two people, any two people, okay, who uh, wish to spend 
their time with each other. I'm not going to say spend their lives with each other because we do understand that sometimes marriages don't work and divorce is a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't define marriage based on procreation, based upon the sex of the participants. Uh, so the I, idea that marriage has not changed since biblical times, which is one of the arguments that they use, again, it's idiotic. Absolutely. In my, in my opinion, it's idiotic. Marriage has changed with each generation. You know, <laughs> the definition of family has changed with generations. Um, in the early 20th century, it was very common for one person of the family, usually the father, to come to America and the children and the children and the um, the children and the wife would in many cases stay behind until the father could send money back that didn't mean that that couple was not still married so for anybody to say that the definition of marriage has not changed since biblical times is wrong in my opinion so it would not be okay for me to have a couple of concubines go ahead david <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, you know that that's fine. You can have a couple of gay concubines, huh. and as Patty long and Aaron? yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't want concubines. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. No, but uh, I mean the difficulty with that is, and this is where we come up against the legal, and it's 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 a line that is that is not sharply delineated. But the but the United States declared long ago that uh, polygamy is not legal here. Yeah, and of course I'm kidding, but when you say that it's changed every generation, my grandfather had a story that he told about um, uh, in his hometown where uh, it was an arranged marriage that he went to and the woman arrived in veils that were just very, very heavy. And when the veils came off, it was a different person than he was promised, but they were already married. So. Right. Well, that goes all the way back. That's a biblical it's tradition a biblical with ja Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. it, but when we say marriage hasn't changed since biblical times, could we imagine that happening today? Well, this is my grandfather's generation even, right. so it does change every generation. It does change every it generation. Uh, it changes within generations. A generation ago, women who were married couldn't own property. Right. 1964 was, was the when, change. In Texas. In Texas. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. that today? The, the, the magnificent late Louise Raggio was mm -hmm. the instigator of that change that actually codified a family law for the first time in the United States mm -hmm. because what married women in Texas couldn't have a bank account, couldn't mm -hmm. own land mm. in Texas in 1964. Some right. of us were even born before then. Mm. <laughs> Nothing, nothing, Doc. Uh, we, we were just commenting how old you are. Um, but, but um, okay, so, um, so marriage means all kinds of other things that it didn't mean years ago. Right. Well, you know, I'm going to, and uh, God forgive me for this, no. but uh, I'm going to allude to a popular program on TV known as Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're an aficionado of Grey's Anatomy, uh, two of the principal characters have their marriage on a post-it note. What they, did, what they decided several years ago in the series was simply, and the writers I thought were brilliant, is the fact that they wrote what marriage meant to them. They put it on a post-it note, it's over their bed, and that's what it means to them. I mean, so I don't know what it would mean in terms of legal property rights and all that, uh, but that was their definition of marriage. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the definition of marriage for me, yes, there is a legal requirement mm -hmm. in terms of property rights and in terms of legal rights. But marriage for me is kedushin. It's mm -hmm. two people who pledge themselves to each other that their relationship will be unlike any other relationship they have with any other person. So you're saying the same thing that we've been saying, that there's a difference, you know, and we've been saying this for years, there's a difference between legal marriage and religious marriage, that the religious marriage, you're defining it a number of ways, the relationship, the respect, the, uh, the caring for each other, as well as, in many cases, having children. But the, the legal part of marriage is the property rights the legal rights, all, all those other uh, things that, uh, that the marriage license itself gives you. You can't testify against your spouse. No. You know, which is the big one that Aaron and I are looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're really pissed off at each other. Uh, right. right. <laughs> now, uh, you know, one other thing, though, at the beginning of the show, you said um, 
you had a visit from a Jehovah's Witness. I did, and okay. I feel so badly about it. Okay. On Friday. Uh, but tell what, just tell quickly what happened, because I want to go off on that for okay. a second. Um, I was, um, I work from home, so I was um, uh, greeted by a Jehovah's Witness um, who had literature and was asking me to, uh, offering a attendance at a, a service they were offering, and I declined and such, and it was on Friday, on Good Friday. And as she was leaving, I, saw, I yelled, Happy Easter, as I was closing the door. Just to be nice, you said that. You were not saying Yes. I, I mean, I then realized, said it nicely, oops. you know. And I realized, oh, oh no, they don't they celebrate, don't celebrate holidays. holidays. They don't even celebrate okay. birthdays. Okay, so. so when we're talking about one person's religion interfering with another person's religion, um, that person has a right to knock on your door to proselytize. Mm -hmm. You have the right to say no thank you. Mm -hmm. Or, or you had the right, I guess, to just slam the door. But I mean, I yelled this, Happy this, Easter. This, she did leave the gate wide open, though. Th there's nothing wrong with being polite, though. So you just said no thanks. So did does doesn't that person's religious right end at your door? It does, indeed. It, yeah, you of course. say that's a I great way to put it. I need not invite her in because it's my home. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, you know, if a, if a person came to my door, as they have in the past mm -hmm. with evangelical materials, uh, I simply say thank you. That's not my belief. I uh, respect yours. And, uh, you know, have please a good day. Ha have a good day. Mm -hmm. um, Girl Scouts with cookies are a different story. That's part of my religion. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, girl, the cookies, <laughs> not the Girl Scouts. I want the cookies would be great. But I think that's a great way to leave it. We're, we're just about out of time. Uh, Rabbi Steve Fish, I want to thank you for being here. Have a happy rest of your Passover. Thank you. But I love that analogy, David. It ends at my door. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patty, have a very nice Easter. Thank you. Thank if you're going back Thank downtown you. to First Baptist, say hi to Pastor Jeffers. I for shall. Us. Tell him that we would love to have him on the show sometime. And for all of us here at Lambda Weekly, we'll see you next week. KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you.